So our next speaker is Veronica Madonna. She's with uh, Moriyama and Tishima in, uh, in Toronto. She's there since 2008. Um, and she was the project architect for the Arbor, which will, she will explain to us. Well, thank you, everyone, and thank you for joining uh, me here and inviting me, actually, to speak about the Arbor, which is a project that we're currently working on. Uh, my name is Veronica Madonna. I'm a principal with Moriyama Tashima Architects, and I am uh, the project lead on the Arbor. Um, so just to start off today um, and tonight, we'll talk a little bit about the design of the arbor and how we approached the building. We'll talk about the sustainability agenda as well as the structural innovations. So just to start off, the arbor is a 10-story mass timber assembly occupancy building. So it is outside of the building code. And I'll talk a little bit about how we are managing that. Um, it is also projected to be net zero carbon. So there's a high sustainability initiative to the arbor as well. Um, so that'll be the first half, so talk a little bit about how we approach the design of the arbor. Uh, the second half, I'm going to talk a little bit about the lessons that we're learning. And I'm saying learning because we're continuously learning how to approach mass timber in uh, the construction industry today. So we're going to talk a little bit about the challenges and the opportunities that we are facing. We're going to talk about our approach with the authorities having jurisdiction and how we're actually managing to realize the arbor. And also um, some of the aspects that we're learning uh, in the mass timber industry here in Canada. So the Arbor is a project that we are doing in a uh, joint venture with Actron Austria Architects, and they are actually the architects uh, of the Brock Commons, the Tallwood project that Jesse spoke of um, in Vancouver at the University of British Columbia. So we partner with them um, because of their expertise and the fact that they've actually done a mass timber building, which is actually very unique because there aren't a lot of people here in Canada that have actually managed to construct a mass timber building. Um, our uh, we've, we've armed ourselves with an amazing team, and I wanted to spend a couple of minutes talking about our team, because if it isn't about, without our team, we would never be able to really realize this type of project. Our structural engineers are FASTENAP from uh, Vancouver, and they are to be credited for the innovations in the structural um, system that we are proposing for the Arbor. Uh, we have um, a mechanical engineer, Integral, um, fantastic engineer here in Toronto uh, for mechanical electrical, uh, also our lead. We have um, our code consultants, our GHL, and they're actually out of the West Coast. And we chose GHL because of their um, expertise and experience in actually applying and managing to achieve an alternative compliance of a mass timber building. Um, they are working very closely with CHM, which is our fire consultant. And so this is a consultant we actually never had to use before, but they are helping us understand the charring um, aspects of our structure and how to actually achieve that. Um, our building envelope is Morrison Hirschfield and our sustainability um, uh, consultant is TransSolar out of New York and they're guiding us with the net zero carbon um, aspirations. So um, I just wanted to make it take a step back and tell you a little bit about Moriyama Toshima Architects. So we just celebrated our 60 years uh, last year and was started by Raymond Moriyama. And one of the things that we all hold true in the office is, is that the core principle of the office was that all buildings and all structures are connected to the environment in which they sit. And um, that is something that we held true in the Arbor as well. Being in an urban environment, the Arbor, um, we were greatly uh, um, inspired by Raymond and Tetsushima's um, aspirations for um, making buildings that respond to its environment and its current needs. Uh, this is a project, uh, this is the Ontario Science Centre, and when it was initially conceived, um, it was conceived with this in mind. These are recent photographs that we had of the building where the building was really meant to um, embrace itself in nature and in its environment. And the kind of thinking of the future was always part of, of, the, um, of the ethos of the, of the uh, firm. This is the Tokyo Embassy. And again, it's just meant to really blend with its landscape. And the Canadian War Museum is uh, actually one of the uh, more recent examples of a building that is just meant to form out of the landscape. It's actually one of the um, uh, largest green roofs, or was for the longest time, uh, built to date. Um, and it just kind of comes out of the earth in which it sits. 
When we um, started the Arbor, um, the Arbor is, a, as I mentioned, a 10-story mass timber building. It is for George Brown College, and it will be their newest building at their waterfront campus. There's two buildings right now as part of their waterfront campus, and this will be their third. And back in um, early 2018, uh, George Brown had um, instigated an international design competition for a mass timber, uh, at the time net positive, uh, building and uh, we were one of four um, firms chosen to uh, actually prepare a design competition. It was a, a three-month uh, design competition, in which case we kind of took it well into uh, schematic design. And what one of the things we kind of really realized in doing this competition is is that the all the um, firms that were part of the competition they were all paired with another firm, joint venture. And that kind of really spoke true to how there's limited experience in mass timber currently. And we're really learning from each other in terms on making uh, mass timber reality here in Canada. And even as we work through the Arbor, we're uh, constantly speaking to our peers, speaking to the architects of the uh, tall project at the University of Toronto and working very closely with Acton Austri uh, and understanding the uh, challenges and opportunities that we will be faced with. At the start of the project, George Brown College, which I'll say is a college that doesn't really build a lot, and I just wanted to uh, make mention that they should really be acknowledged for their high aspirations for the Arbor, because I truly believe it starts there with the client. If the client has the aspirations, it really opens the doors for us to um, achieve what we could imagine to achieve. These were the four pillars that the uh, that George Brown College had aspired for the Arbor. It was to be low carbon, so meant to be mass timber. Um, it was to be a smart building. Okay, So how can it be smart in its function so that it can continuously learn and optimize its energy efficiency? Um, at the time, they aspired to be net positive. And we had uh, presented our competition um, and was clear to say that that was not possible due to the density of, this, of the building and the footprint of it. And I'll explain a little bit um, a little later in the presentation. And it was meant to be future-proofed. When we started the Arbor, you know, these were some of our inspirations. And it was about how do we make the most compact building and breathe room into it breathe room into it for the social spaces, for the sustainability agenda, for the mass timber agenda. And so we came up with these, uh, this idea of the uh, breathing rooms. And the breathing rooms uh, are a series of student interaction spaces that flank uh, either end of the building as it rises 10 stories. And these spaces are um, the social interaction space, so breathing room into the academic program. It is the uh, literal breathing room for the solar chimney, which is part of our sustainability strategy. And it's also breaking open the structure to breathe a little bit more room to make a little bit generous spaces. So the Arbor is located at the corner of Queens Key Boulevard and Lower Shorebourne. And it's at a very prominent part of the waterfront. Adjacent to the building is Lower Shorebourne Commons Park, which allows for three faces of the building to really be exposed. Um, when you approach the building, you approach it uh, in the center of the east facade, underneath the solar chimney, and when you come into the building, you arrive at the base of the learning landscape, which is the main student interaction space of the building. The learning landscape rises three stories along Queen's Quay in order to animate the, the elevation and the streetscape. And it's a series of uh, student interaction spaces, a variety of different types of spaces for students to interact with uh, faculty members, to interact with the industry, and become really a community room. Each level of the learning landscape is really meant to look upon each other in order to connect the building vertically. And at the third floor, we have a series of large lecture halls, which are meant to be flexible um, with retractable seating. The seating will be uh, allowed to be pushed back and become, and the uh, movable walls um, are implemented in order to become a conference center. At the center of the third floor, there's a feature stair that rises up to the pedestrian connection that will connect the arbor to the existing George Brown building. 
And again, this is a way in order to promote uh, healthy and active living uh, and uh, encourage people to use the stairs rather than the elevators. And at the either end of each floor plate is a series of two-story breathing rooms which become the um, student social interaction space, the living room, if you may say. Um, and there are two of these per floor. The, um, the building in itself is armed with a high-performing, durable um, facade which is meant to um, materialize the waterfront. There's a lot of uh, glass condos currently along the waterfront, and our objective was to create some material. And we don't have a rooftop penthouse. Instead, we have decentralized mechanical systems, which allow for the top floor of the arbor to be fully occupiable and maximize some of the amazing views that we have to Lake Ontario, which is kind of rare uh, currently in Toronto to find a site that will allow that. We have a sloped roof uh, to the building, which is um, part of the um, uh, armature for the solar panels facing south. Um, so here we are at the Toronto waterfront. Uh, the uh, building is located within the uh, Waterfront East Bay uh, District, which is an area of land uh, which has Waterfront Toronto um, authority over. And on our block, um, this is, um, it, for those who may not be completely familiar with Toronto, a lot of the waterfront right now is currently um, residential uh, condo condominiums. And this block that the arbor sits on is kind of the worker bee block of the uh, downtown waterfront. We have the uh, Daphne Cockwell building, which is uh, the George Brown existing building, uh, which is uh, site B. We have the Chorus building, which is an entertainment office uh, facility, uh, E. And we have uh, the Innovation Complex, which is a um, building which is currently being built uh, right adjacent to the arbor. So Sugar Beach is right there, and then to the left and to the east of the arbor is um, Sherburn Commons. So the signing of the project actually allowed us to have a really an east facade that could really be exposed because there will never be development on Sherburn Commons. In terms of the part T of the building and the structural part T, you know, um, as you may know, mass timber is a gravity load type structure. It does not like to cantilever. It likes to load gravity uh, directly down. And so it becomes a very dense, compact uh, system. Mass timber also doesn't like to span very much. And I'll talk about how we manage our spans in an academic building uh, for this project. And what was really important to us and what's important to any post-secondary building is this idea of the student interaction space because we believe this is where the students really come out of the learning environment and really collaborate and foster another level of creative learning. And so we have the learning landscape, as I mentioned, uh, that um, rises three stories along Queen's Key Boulevard. I should also state that about 60% of our ground floor is a daycare, which is to the south. So we're very limited to how much space was being used for the post-secondary uh, use, which we concentrated on Queen's Key to give George Brown presence. And we have the two-story breathing rooms on either end, which are two-story rooms skip, um, in the skip fashion along um, the building and right adjacent two solar chimneys, which I'll explain uh, in a little bit, but we have a solar chimney along the east face and a solar chimney along the west face, which are, is driving our engineered passive ventilation for the building. When we started the competition, we started the design, what we realized though is, is that the Arbor was really an academic building. It needed to have a uh, number of classroom spaces. And one of the challenges with classroom spaces and with mass timber is, is that um, we really need to get at least a nine meter bay in order to get clear view angles in the classroom spaces. Um, mass timber doesn't quite like to span that far unless you're going with very deep members uh, um, or long span type structures like trusses and whatnot. So we were um, challenged with creating a structural, structural solution that would give us a nine meter bay at least in one direction so that we can get our clear view angles in these academic spaces. And um, the way we're doing it is I'll explain how exactly we're doing it, but we are spanning a 9.2 meter bay with a CLT slab band. 
um, which is currently being tested and engineered um, uh, in order to prove its engineering on that aspect. The planning of the arbor is a three bar system, which means that all of the dark planning is in the middle bar, the cores, the washrooms, anything that doesn't need light. And we can then reserve the outer bays to um, uh, allow for uh, maximized light in the teaching spaces, as well as utilize the natural ventilation uh, system in the occupied spaces. There are some areas in the arbor where the nine meter bay actually needs to increase to at least 12 and a half. And at that point, um, as with anything, uh, mass timber, um, the system, the CLT system that we are we have designed maximizes its ability. So we are enhancing the system with um, steel um, in order to help gain that span. But at the you know at the end of the day, the the building is a academic building and it needs to work for that purpose. That was our main objective for the Arbor, is for it to be uh, a building that really worked for George Brown in terms of a teaching building. So that just shows some of the flexibility. But what I will also mention on this slide is, is that the two cores inside uh, each floor plate, this is where we have two mechanical rooms per floor, which is the decentralized mechanical system. And it allows for flexibility of the system in order to, um, first of all, allow George Brown to shut zones off in the building, um, and also reduces the amount of fan power. Instead of pushing air up and down a building, um, the air is being fed directly per floor two mechanical rooms per floor. But one of the challenges is that, is, is that it takes up floor space. Floor space that we had to accept was going to be gone, um, and we needed to work around that. The overall organization of the building is levels one through three are the kind of more uh, special type uh, floor plates. This is the learning landscape, the um, heavy student interaction space, and the large lecture halls. And then levels four through eight are the... Um, uh, the, the, the typical teaching spaces. Levels 9 and 10 are reserved for the Mass Timber Institute, which will be a um, research uh, institute um, to study mass timber and various aspects of uh, mass timber. We, this slide is here just to show that um, just based on the placement of where the building is, we had some very strict um, height restrictions that we had to maintain through Waterfront Toronto. So in order, you know, one of our challenges this was is to achieve the um, number of floors that we needed to achieve in order to fit the program, but uh, also be within the height restrictions that were stipulated. So what we were really looking for is a flat structural system so that we could reduce our base size. And this actually started to become very interesting to us because if we figured if we can actually achieve a nine meter bay with a reduced um, depth of the uh, members, of the structural members, this could be a system that would be transferable to a lot of industries. Not just a simple one-off solution for George Brown, but we can see developers and a lot of different um, people interested in this type of system in order to really catalyze the mass timber industry. Um, but at the end of the day, what we were looking for in terms of uh, experience was this kind of variety of space of student interaction where the students actually inhabit the mass timber, learn about the mass timber. Um, it will be the um, home of um, computer uh, technology design as well as architectural design. So students will actually be learning from the building as they work within. And our main goals was to inspire, catalyze, and innovate um, for the Arbor. So one of the key objectives was is that we really wanted to make the mass timber a learning piece. Um, projects like Brock Commons encapsulated the entirety of the mass timber systems. You actually don't see the system while you're there. One of our main objectives was to uh, expose as much as the mass timber uh, that we can. And we're currently working with the City of Toronto um, and um, we are working with about a 50% exposed mass timber structural solution. And what we've done in that case is that we've concentrated the exposed mass timber in the areas that count, and that's the public spaces and the student interaction spaces. So people can really start to see and um, inhabit the, mass, the uh, wood structure. The way that we're going about the mass timber is um, through a char solution. So um, there was a question about the National Building Code. and. So just to be clear, this is a 10-story academic building, so an A2 building um, is not permitted to be combustible. And so we are going through an alternative compliance. Uh, we're working closely with the City of Toronto in order to prove um, 
that the charring system, in particular with the um, exposed mass timber, is as safe as a um, non-combustible structure, steel or concrete. Um, the 2020 code is um, expected to um, uh, allow for a 12-story, um, I believe it's office or commercial building, as an encapsulated solution. So even at that point, currently the Ontario Building Code allows for uh, six stories, commercial and office. Um, the assembly would not even be considered, even at a six-story. Six um, but the uh, 2020 code, we are expecting to see encapsulation as part of that to 12 stories. So that didn't, you know, for the Arbor, what we needed to do is prove that the char solution would uh, actually work for maintaining a two-hour fire rating system for the project. So we're working with CHM uh, Fire, who are brilliant fire consultants that are, um, have done a lot of testing, a lot of research uh, into demonstrating char. And so what we are uh, proposing is uh, about a two-inch sacrificial layer around the structural member so that if the building were to ever catch on fire, um, I'm sure you've all tried to start a campfire with a log, and it just doesn't start, right? Um, because it creates that kind of layer, that protective layer of char around it, right? Um, so that's kind of the idea of the char effect. So the building, if it were to ever catch on fire, would create a layer around itself, and there's a um, an equation that you can do in order to understand how thick that is compared to what your fire resistant rating is. Also, um, it has to do a lot with how much flammables you have in the building. So for the Arbor, there's going to be a limit on any products that are have a high flame spread rating. Um, and the structural solution, uh, the structural section within the actual member is maintained uh, for at least two hours, which is our fire uh, rating on, on the Arbor. So another aspect I just want to really mention quickly here is, is that we started working with the city immediately. So as soon as we won the competition, we had a meeting with the city. Um, and again, it's the cooperation of those who we work with that really allow for this project to happen. The City of Toronto has a mass timber task force in place that are specifically looking at this project and a number of other mass timber projects that are currently on the books for um, the City of Toronto. And um, they have allowed us to submit the alternative compliance ahead of the building permit, which was really important to us because if there was any aspects of the building that they did not agree with, we needed to know that sooner than later. Normally we go in for building permit around 85, 90% complete construction documents. We couldn't wait that long. So we started having conversations with the city immediately and through a number of meetings and meeting with a number of city staff, including the chief fire uh, marshal, um, we were able to establish a strategy for the Arbor. Peer review was part of that. So we have um, peer reviewing our fire and we also have a peer review of our structure. Um, which was part of uh, the process as well, as well as a number of redundant systems. We have two connections to the fire main uh, at the city level. Just in case one goes down, the second is available. So there's a number of redundancy, and we had to work this through as a strategy um, with the city uh, in order to develop the alternative solution. We're also considering prefabricated uh, wall assemblies, which... Jesse touched upon in his um, presentation, and effectively this is to protect the mass timber as it goes up. Um, we're working with a construction manager currently in order to establish the right system for the arbor. The site is a very uh, constrained site, so we have limited spaces for cranes, we have limited spaces for scaffolding. Um, so we need to work with the construction managers and those experts in construction in order to develop the system. So it's very much a collaborative process. We're working on what size panels we can get away with. There's a certain aesthetic that we want to achieve at the Arbor, so we're working with, um, with them on how to develop that. Uh, we're building mock-up samples, and part of the sustainability solution is, is that we're designing a R30 effective wall system. And which is, means quite a bit of heavy insulation in the wall. And so we're looking at our thermal bridging and we're looking at our, um, the connection of the wall panels very closely in order to assure that we can maintain the um, R value uh, in order to achieve our sustainability goals. 
Um, another aspect of mass timber is this high level of coordination that needs to happen. So we are currently in the design development process and we're broaching into construction documents. And once we kind of get to that point, we're bracing ourselves for a very high level of coordination because mass timber is all prefabricated in the shop. Every single penetration for pipes or ductworks has to be pre-coordinated in order for it to be CNC'd out of the panel. The coordination element uh, during the design period is much more extensive. So I'll just talk uh, briefly about the sustainability goals. So as I mentioned, we are targeting net zero carbon. And um, the reason that, um, um, you know, when George Brown issued uh, their competition, they had said net, net positive. Net positive means you have to generate the same amount of energy on your site uh, and with a surplus um, than you consume. Uh, so the Arbor being an academic building, we're expecting about 3,500 students in the building and with a very tight site, we're building property line to property line. The amount of space that we had available for renewable re um, energy resources was very limited. So that wouldn't work for us, and we're very clear with that. But what we are doing is um, net zero carbon, meaning that we're bringing the energy efficient of the building down as far as we can, and then we are um, uh, going to use carbon-free renewable energy sources uh, in order to offset um, the energy use. Um, there are a number of sustainability goals that we are targeting. Uh, we are targeting um, uh, uh, low-carbon building materials, uh, net zero carbon. Um, we are gonna, uh, targeting LEED gold uh, certification. Uh, and we're also targeting the Toronto G Green Standards uh, Tier 4, uh, which is actually one of the highest um, energy performance standards that the City of Toronto has set out to date. Um, you are mandated to meet Tier 1, uh, and George Brown has... Um, uh, uh, aspire to meet Tier 4, which is effectively a net zero building. So the way that we're meeting the uh, Tier 4 and the way that we're meeting the uh, energy efficiency of the building is through a number of different strategies. Um, energy performance is one, so how do we reduce the energy uh, usage in the building as much as possible. Uh, we have a passive um, uh, engineered natural ventilation system. So the solar trimony will be driving air through the building and we are expecting to be able to close the mechanical system down for about four to five months of the year. Envelope performance is highly important. Uh, it gets really hot in Toronto in the summer and it gets really cold in the winter. We need to ensure that we have a very high um, envelope. And daylighting becomes actually very important in terms of uh, harvesting uh, daylight in the spaces so we can keep the lights off um, for longer periods of time. Um, the building um, will use district energy. When we first designed the building, we were looking towards geothermal, but since um, George Brown has agreed to be using N-Wave, which is the deep water heating and cooling, which is a great resource in Toronto that we currently have, um, they are making arrangements with N-Wave to install carbon-free um, uh, uh, equipment in their, in their plant uh, to provide the uh, energy for the arbor. We didn't want to just offset the carbon from the arbor into somewhere else. Um, they, are pro they are providing electrical um, equipment uh, rather than carbon, carbon using equipment in, in, um, in the N-Wave plant. And we have decentralized um, ERV um, energy recovery ventilators in the uh, building. Um, so the way that the uh, building works is, is we have uh, two effective systems, this, the passive system and then the active system. Um, the passive system, as I mentioned, we do expect it to be working for quite a long period of time during the year. Um, it will be, the building will be heavily censored in order to be uh, monitoring the relative humidity, the uh, temperature, in order for um, it to tell the system when is it okay, an okay time to open the windows, right? Um, the um, building is going to be user friendly, so at any point of the year, um, people can actually open the windows. Uh, there are just a number of spaces, like the public spaces, where the windows might be up high, um, that will be, they will be automated. But otherwise, in the classrooms, people will have the control. If they are hot, they can open the windows. Um, 
So the windows, uh, so the natural ventilation system works in that it um, pulls air in from the windows. It's going to transfer through into the corridor, which is a design challenge for us in that we need to maintain a certain level of acoustics in the classrooms, between the classroom and the corridor. So we're working with our acoustical engineer to develop acoustical um, baffles at the kind of transfer duct level. And then once it gets into the uh, corridor, it'll travel uh, to the breathing rooms. And so the solar chimney is made up of um, effectively a glass cavity. It's a single pane uh, glass on the outside, a double pane on the uh, inside. And in between, um, there's a number of uh, shelves, heat shelves, that will heat up the air and through natural convection would allow heat uh, to rise and pull the air through the system. Um, there's going to be louvers uh, in uh, the solar chimney uh, that will, um, the, the building automation system and the smart aspect of the building will tell the solar chimney at to what percentage to open the windows based on the pressure that is needed. In the active mode, um, the building uh, has a raised floor access system. And as I mentioned, two mechanical rooms on either end of the uh, floor plate. And um, it will feed each floor plate. Um, th those mechanical rooms will feed each floor plate. So we're intaking and exhausting air on every floor, which again is another design challenge that we're resolving in that there is going to be a number of intake and exhausts on every level that aren't always the sightliest. So we need to design for that. Um, the air is going to distribute through the raised floor system at a low velocity and it'll provide air into each of the classrooms and occupied spaces. Um, I do also want to mention that, um, since I have this slide up, the cores of the building, when we initially designed the cores of the building, we had imagined them as a CLT um, core. Um, there was a lot of discussion about this with the City of Toronto. They weren't quite ready to accept a CLT fire stair. Um, there was a bit of an emotional aspect to um, having firefighters go up and down a fire stair. That's wood. Even though it would be encapsulated in wood, and even though the test results show that it is um, maintaining the same level of safety. So um, another aspect to the core was is that we needed to, because of our decentralized mechanical systems, we needed to um, uh, break through the core on a number, of, uh, a number of times. And so we actually started to reduce the shear capacity of CLT. So this is a moment where the wood started to become less desirable, and the core for the arbor is currently being designed as a steel core. It's being designed as steel so that it can go up at the same time as the mass timber. The form of the building is purposeful. Um, the angled roof is an armature for the um, solar uh, panels that are going to be on the south facade. Um, and so the building closes down on the north and kind of opens up on the south in order to... Um, um, well, actually, it closes down on the south and it kind of takes the, uh, the solar um, gain from the solar panels and opens up on the north. And um, it was really important for the building design to be integrated into the sustainability solution. But what that meant is, is that we have to go through a number of variances because the colored aspects is what the city imagines a building to be. You know, a box with a mechanical penthouse and the arbor is a little different. One aspect of the solar chimney is, is that it needs to rise higher than the last floor that it serves. So naturally, it needs to be taller. Um, and we don't quite fit within the zoning model. So we're working with the city and their urban design uh, department to um, achieve uh, a minor variance for that. Um, so just a little bit more depth, the passive system. Um, so as I mentioned, um, people have control of the windows and there'll be some type of uh, digital signs that will allow people to know when is a good time to actually open the windows. Um, and there's going to be a number of ceiling fans throughout the building so that uh, the ceiling fans will just allow for a more temperate temperature and perhaps um, indicate that it's okay to have the thermostat set a little bit higher as long as we feel comfortable. So the ceiling fans are going to help with that. And then we need to transfer the air through the uh, corridor, which is um, modestly shown here. It's going to be a much wider transfer duct through there. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, the air is going to go into the breathing rooms and then transfer into the solar chimney. In the active mode, um, uh, the uh, air will just be running through uh, the mechanical system. Um, 
with, uh, through the raised floor system, and it'll uh, raise at a uh, low velocity. We have uh, heating and cooling radiant panels, and the fresh air is being distributed at the floor level. So the uh, uh, radiant panels are at the ceiling level, and the fresh air is at the floor level. Uh, so we're working through the pressure optimization of the solar chimney in order to understand the area that we need to design it to. And we're also going through a number of uh, daylight studies in order to optimize uh, the percentage of glazing. And in fact, we are being told by our sustainable engineers to, give, to put more glazing in in order to get more daylight. But we have, to have a very, we have to have a balancing act in that glazing obviously doesn't perform as well as a wall. And so we want to balance how much glazing we have. Um, and so these are our current metrics for the building. We are expected to have an energy use intensity of 65 kilowatt hours. I think actually our last model ran at 63. Um, and uh, our thermal energy demand, our TEDI, is at 15 kilowatt hours. And our greenhouse gas emissions is at four. And these targets are all within the Toronto Green Building Standards. And the way that we're achieving those is, is that you know the, um, the energy use intensity is really about you know, um, reducing the interior lighting, um, reducing the fan power, reducing the plug loads. Now, this is a, a school for computer technology and for architecture, which is going to have a lot of high plug loads. And we can't tell them not to plug their computers in. Um, but what we can do is shut the lights off or um, look at different solutions for cloud-based server type computers. Um, so that's kind of the strategy we're doing. Um, the, uh, the, the TEDI is uh, really about the high-performing envelope and the ERV systems. And there's no fuel-fired fuel uh, equipment in, in the building. Um, so there's structural innovation. So the arbor is going to have a series of glue lamb columns and cross-laminated timber um, slab bands, which is effectively the beam action, and infill slab panels. And so um, in order to achieve the nine meter bay solution, um, the arbor is designed with a nine meter bay in one direction and a seven meter in the other direction so that we can get clear view angles to the front of room. To achieve that, we have longer elongated columns. They're 1,200 millimeters by 400 millimeters wide, and that includes the charring. Um, capacity of, of the mass timber. So they're quite long columns. And then we have a nine ply CLT slab band that will sit on top. And we designed the slab band so that um, Canadian manufacturers could provide the mass timber. Europe is currently doing slab bands as long as 12 meters. We wanted to ensure that Canada can uh, compete in um, obtaining this job if, if they choose to compete. Um, and then we would infill the panels, and it's, it kind of is this simple. We have the columns, the slab bands, and then the infill panels, which is a seven-ply CLT member, and that creates our nine-meter bay. On top of the um, CLT is a concrete topping, and we had chosen to do concrete topping uh, for the acoustic reasons of the project. We need to maintain a certain acoustic level, floor to floor, between the classrooms. And uh, wood is just very light. Wood does not, uh, tr wood transfers noise very easily. And so the concrete's gonna help provide that density and uh, stop the footfall um, noise transfer. And then on top of that is our raised floor access system. And so what we end up with is very, with a very flat um, solution, a st flat structural solution, so we can minimize floor to floor heights, which as I mentioned before was a direct challenge of the arbor in terms of some of the height restrictions. And this is a solution, as we mentioned, that we think can be transferred into the industry. We can imagine developers really liking this idea because they can minimize floor to floor heights and uh, optimize spans, and it reduces um, uh, you know, interference with your mechanical systems and, and all the other systems you normally have running uh, through your building. Um, these are just some current uh, sections of the, um, of the mass timber uh, that's currently being tested at the UBC, actually at the Wood Innovation Center. Um, and so the engineering has been done, and as part of the alternative compliance for the mass timber, we are testing uh, 
the structural capacity and the shear capacity of the uh, slab band design. So it's currently being loaded, and we'll understand to what level will it, uh, in, in order to uh, prove the engineering. Once that is done, those reports will become available and published um, through NRCAN Canada to uh, become available to all uh, engineering firms out there. Um, we're really kind of beside ourselves because the project has already won a number of awards. We, you know, it's an unbuilt project, but um, it's already being recognized, which we, we think is a great opportunity for it to become a learning tool uh, for, for, you know, what's kind of happening here um, in Canada. This is just some updated imagery um, that we've been working on. Um, so we are looking at a number of uh, solutions, and we are not um, uh, looking at wood. And it's kind of a interesting. We never thought the wood, the building looked like wood on the outside, but I think everyone else did. And so we're questioned all the time as to the wood cladding, but the wood cladding is not permitted because it is a combustible material. Um, we are proving the mass timber um, because of its charring ability, but dimensional lumber does not have that ability. Um, so wood is not being um, considered for the exterior. Uh, so we had uh, proposed the, the building as a, an aluminum cladding, um, and um, we've been looking at a number different of facade solutions. Um, so the, the whole wall system is, is a non-combustible wall system. So um, just the lessons learned. Um, so these are some of the challenges that we're faced with in mass timber is, is that the depth to span ratio, um, the, you know, the, the cost of mass timber. Currently, um, we're looking at about a 20% increase with a, with a mass timber solution, um, mainly because there are limited um, manufacturers here in Canada, as well as limited experience. And as that kind of increases, um, we can imagine that the cost of mass timber will go down. The approvals um, is a challenge in that there's a number of additional steps that have to be done, and there's additional time. So um, that has to be considered in, in, the, um, in the design. And, and also, uh, there was a question about insurance. And insurance is uh, an aspect and a consideration. And so George Brown has been working with their insurance company uh, early on in order to see if there were any design features that they would require in the building. And I was recently at a conference in Quebec. It was a Woodrise conference which brought together um, uh, people from around the world to talk about what they're doing in wood construction. And insurance and authorities were actually the two biggest challenges that I heard from all countries, Sweden, Norway, Japan, uh, that are doing uh, wood structures a lot. Uh, the coordination has to be highly coordinated um, because it's all prefabricated. Vibration, acoustics, and fire. Those are all very important considerations we have to think about in terms of our detailing and design. Um, so this depth to span, you know, these are just some uh, different solutions that we have been looking towards in some of our, in, in, you know, we look towards this in the Arbor and some of our other mass timber projects in the office right now. Um, just different uh, options for mass timber. There's this uh, delta beam option, which allows you to do a long span, but it's a s proprietary steel beam member, which the CLT um, slab band panels can kind of fit within. Um, there's box beam out there currently as well. So through this process, we've kind of been learning a lot about what the different options in mass timber is, because the solution of the arbor isn't the only solution. And, you know, again, the cost issue is, is a huge one in that, um, you know, to inc increase the cost of a project by 20% is a major undertaking, especially for an institutional client, especially for George Brown, where um, their pockets are not deep. So we have to be very mindful of that. And so we're monitoring costs uh, very closely with the construction manager. The um, uh, wood is, is designed as a kit of parts, and it's going to be cataloged and come to site. It's going to be shipped in a truck and effectively taken off the truck and installed on the building. Uh, for the Arbor, we don't have any laydown space really for the building, so it has to be just-in-time delivery, which has to be considered in the construction, uh, in the detailing and design process. Um, the precision has to be very... Uh, 
uh, highly coordinated. And so as we understand it, um, we're going to be doing our own high-level coordination. And then once we're done with it, it's going to go through the shop drawing process with the timber manufacturer. And they will do their own as well. And so we'll have a very robust shop drawings um, of the building that will prepare the panels uh, to go to the CNC uh, machine in order for it to all be cut out and, and ready to come. All the connections will be done in the shop as well um, between the, the wood panels. Uh, this is a, uh, a current kind of sketch of the acoustic bulkhead that we're looking at. We have to allow the air to flow through, but we want to stop noise from transferring. So we're looking at these chevron acoustic panels inside the area in order to um, bounce uh, the noise back and forth but allow air to flow through. Just going to skip through some of these. Um, so um, this slide is here just to kind of talk a little bit about what our process has been. So when we were awarded the project, uh, the, our process with the authorities, we were awarded the project in April. Um, in May, we were talking with the authorities already, so about a month after we were awarded. And then we submitted a memorandum of understanding, and this was an agreement that was made between George Brown and the City of Toronto to um, define the path that we were going to take in terms of developing the alternative compliance because there's a lot of risk on both ends, uh, the city and the client. Um, we met with them regularly through this period, and uh, at the end of September, we submitted our draft alternative compliance for the um, mass timber, and we're not expected to submit the building permit until um, early next year. So they're reviewing the, uh, the alternative compliance, and we will be um, meeting any other expectations that they have uh, before we issue a building permit set. So some of the aspects that the city had kind of asked for when we were doing our reviews with them is, this, again, two connections of the sprinkler in order for sprinkler reliability, um, increased sprinkler density in the building, um, enhanced smoke detection. Um, initially, they wanted us to look at an evacuation model, um, but that had since been um, uh, not required. Um, oversizing the structural members for char, where there's exposed structural members. Um, we have a peer review process for both fire and uh, structure. And uh, there, we're also uh, speaking about um, temporary fire protection during construction, because it's a real um, concern that um, uh, there could be uh, fire during construction. Um, and increased security during construction. Um, so some of the challenges in terms of the construction is, is that competitive tendering becomes very difficult um, because there's limited expertise right now. So competitive tendering uh, is, is a challenge. Um, the prefabrication element uh, is a different way of thinking and designing a building. Um, On-site protection, again, the security. Water leaks, um, as Jesse was talking about, water leaks during construction. We're very um, carefully thinking about how we're going to construct the mass timber. Um, and prefabricated wall systems. So we're currently thinking three floors at a time um, and the wall system will go up. So th three floors of the core will go up, the mass timber will go in uh, with a waterproofing membrane on top. We're kind of debating the waterproofing membrane because of the dry out rate. And then um, the envelope will be going at the same time as the um, mass timber construction. Um, another challenge, uh, as Jesse had touched upon, was the um, mass timber industry here in Canada. So currently there are, no, there are very few mass timber suppliers uh, in Canada. And in terms of CLT, there are actually um, two certified CLT manufacturers currently in Canada that are um, certified by the current standards. Um, and we do know that there are actually two more coming online. One is in St. Thomas and another is in um, British Columbia. So there's potentially four. And there's also uh, one in uh, the kind of northern edge of um, the United States. And there are a number in uh, uh, Europe, uh, mainly Austria, that provide certified CLT. So you can see the pool in which we can kind of get our CLT is limited which means that the uh, manufacturing time is actually uh, very long. We're looking at a year, so we have to get in line, and we're, if we get in line today, we'll have our CLT in one year. So you have to be mindful of the time duration. And then, of course, where there's demand, there's cost increase. 
Um, so we, as part of the project, uh, George Brown um, was able to receive money from Enercan Canada in order to, uh, for research and development. We went on a number of site trips to go visit the uh, CLT manufacturing plants. We went to Nordique, we went to Structure Lamb. Um, to see what the processes are, see what their quality control is, and to understand the quality of the product that they're making. Um, we're also, you know, uh, learning about all the different products that are available. And we're also learning about the actual wood in itself. The wood from either end of the country is different. In the west, it's predominantly Douglas fir. In the east, it's um, black spruce. So they have very different aesthetics uh, involved. We were also um, looking at the forestry aspect because I don't think we can talk about mass timber without talking about forestry. And so um, we were looking to understand um, if forestry is really a um, managed system here in Canada. And it was very interesting in that CLT is um, predominantly a tree that is 10 years or younger, and it's very well managed and regulated here in Canada. This was some people from our office were actually in the forest. So, um, okay, so I always end uh, this kind of presentation with this, and I probably don't have to preach much uh, to you about this, but this is kind of the reason why we um, are choosing to do this, and that, um, you know, we're kind of faced with this aspect of climate change. This was the Toronto Islands in 2017 and the flooding that was happening there. And we know the world is heating up at an astronomical rate. And what's very interesting is that buildings actually constitute to 45% of the carbon output currently um, in North America, um, both, both Canada and the United States. Uh, we're actually approaching, I think, 50% now. So anybody who's kind of really involved in building or designing should be aware that our buildings are actually one of the major drivers of the carbon output in the atmosphere. And now we know that wood has the ability to sequester carbon, and in fact, it's the only building product that grows by the power of the sun, which is pretty kind of amazing when you think about it. Um, wood sequesters carbon by the rate of one cubic meter. Um, one cubic meter of wood will sequester one ton of carbon. What we also learned through the process is that um, younger forests, like the ones that are being harvested for CLT, um, absorb more carbon than more mature forests. So we're actually think, you know, understanding that mature forests are not, we, we don't want to be going after the big redwoods and whatnot. The younger forests that can be managed and uh, grow quicker are really the ones that um, are most beneficial in absorbing carbon. Um, we're also um, hearing research that Canada right now is actually one of the biggest carbon emitters in the forest because there's a high number of forest fires. And when a, when a forest fire occurs, the carbon that's stored within the wood gets it released into the atmosphere at an astronomical rate. So the idea of mass timber is if you can harvest the product, you can harvest the carbon inside the wood and use it in a permanent building solution, we actually have the ability to reduce the carbon in the atmosphere. Um, the, these are uh, the uh, metrics for the arbor. Um, the arbor is expected to uh, is, have about 9,000 cubic meters of um, wood in it, which is about uh, 8,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide. And just to put it in perspective, um, 2,300 cars are kind of removed from the road uh, in terms of its carbon output. That's it. Thanks. Sure, so the question is, is, did we ever consider or did the George Brown ever consider a hybrid solution for mass timber or perhaps switching mass timber right out based on some of the challenges, uh, including cost. Mass timber has always been a key driver for George Brown. And, I, and again, you know, we're, we're thrilled that we have a client that's so highly aspirational in that point, because a lot of clients would have just backed down when the numbers came in. Um, so George Brown has been kind of maintaining their position on that. On a design front, um, we feel strongly about mass timber because of the... Um, uh, you know, the benefits that it could have in terms of an industry and catalyzing a new way of building, which is a sustainable way of building. 
but we do recognize that mass timber has limitations. And so, um, you know, when we first imagined uh, the arbor, we wanted it to be an all mass timber solution. We said every single component, mass timber, except the foundations, of course. Um, but that couldn't happen. We quickly realized that our core um, needed to be switched out because we weren't achieving the sheer capacity and the authorities weren't willing to have that yet. Um, we also realized that in some of the spaces, um, in terms of the lecture halls, we needed to span longer distances. The mass timber just couldn't do that unless we went with like trusses and larger span systems, which we could do. Um, but what we've done is we've used hybrid solutions in those locations because of the limitations. Because at the end of the day, we kept on reminding ourselves is that the core reason for this building is an academic building for George Brown. It has to provide student learning spaces. And so we need those base sizes. We need um, those different aspects. So I think you know there's always a level of uh, consideration for hybrid because there's limitations to every building material that just needs to be accepted. So the question is, uh, Enercan, uh, the funding through Enercan, is, can it be used for the capital costs of the building, uh, for the mass timber in itself, and whether we're mandated uh, to use Canadian uh, uh, wood? Um, so um, Enercan had provided um, uh, a number of dollars to George Brown for research and development, so meaning that it could not be used to fund the capital construction costs of the project. It was to be used for the engineering testing, so it is being used to um, uh, uh, do all the engineering for the structural test um, and, uh, and the loading tests that are going to uh, occur. Uh, it is being used for these case study um, projects that we're undergoing. It's also being used in order to develop the fire solution, um, but it cannot be used for the capital cost of the project. Um, which really is kind of interesting in that it'll, it maintains the money for research and development, which um, can then benefit everyone because all that research and all that information will be published through Enercan Canada. Um, the second part of the question was um, whether it needed to be Canadian wood. You know, at the off offset of the project, we all want Canadian wood, and we're still striving for that, and we've designed the building in order for it to achieve uh, a structural solution using Canadian products. But Enercan did not stipulate it has to be Canadian wood. That is our end goal, um, but they hadn't stipulated that. It will go out to tender, and we are looking to do a design assist for two reasons. Um, each uh, manufacturer has uh, slightly different solutions to the connections uh, that we want to start detailing immediately. And secondly, we need to get in line in order to actually get the mass timber. So as part of the process, we will be doing a pre-tender for mass timber. So we'll know who the supplier is ahead of the full tendering of the project. So how is the building restored in the event of a fire? So I think one of the key aspects of um, any uh, fire design is, is that the building is meant to maintain its safety for the duration of people um, evacuating. So um, the building uh, in the event of a fire, well, whatever members are charged will have to be replaced, um, just like any other structure in steel, uh, concrete is, a, of course, a, a slightly different uh, situation. So the main objective for the charring is to just maintain safety and the two-hour fire rating uh, for the project. So the um, question is about the prefabricated wall panels and how they're made. Um, so the um, prefabricated wall panels are going to be non-combustible um, material. Uh, so we're currently looking at um, steel studs with uh, non-combustible insulation, uh, we're looking at um, a number of different cladding solutions, and uh, the building will effectively, this, the if assembly will be, uh, the cladding will be clipped to the wind loading uh, studs. So it's, it's going to be designed uh, fairly the same way as any other uh, kind of wall system on these types of buildings will be designed. But what we need to consider now is the joints between the panels. Um, we're looking at um, uh, metal uh, vapor barriers in order to kind of create a lighter frame kind of uh, construction for the project, uh, like a metal sheathing as well. So there's a number of uh, things that we're looking at in order to lighten the load of the prefabricated wall system. Um, and, uh, and then the key detail is the connection detail and how that gets um, resolved. 
So the question is about the uh, MOU, which is the Memorandum of Understanding that we secured with the city, and whether this is something of the future. It's um, it's hard to know. Um, we do know that uh, one other building. Uh, permit has been provided with an alternative compliance in Toronto, which is the Wade Avenue project. And because of that project, the stipulation on the Arbor actually got reduced as we went through the process. So as more and more projects get um, approvals in this way, um, the city may decide to um, re uh, not reduce the requirements, but maybe have a more systematic approach in order how to apply for alternative compliance. The MOU was really um, just the steps that we were going to take. So we outlined that, we, that George Brown um, and the city would engage a peer reviewer. George Brown is paying for the peer reviewer on behalf of the city, so they work for the city. George Brown is paying. Um, and, um, uh, you know, a number of other um, reliability uh, uh, redundancy in the systems uh, were all kind of outlined there. Um, so it's, it's hard to say that as the process becomes more of the norm, perhaps they'll just be built in into the application process. Um, but I think until then, what we're seeing is, is that the city is asking for an MOU from all um, uh, applications uh, of this nature. So there's two aspects to the costing of mass timber. The first is, is that um, mass timber is costed uh, purely by volume. Um, so we can't uh, reduce that cost, right? So the volume of the project is the volume. Uh, we looked at ways to maybe revise the system to reduce the, the volume of wood. Um, in terms of uh, the, uh, the the costing in itself, we, we we the construction manager has come on board early into the project in order to help offset those costs. So we're looking at ways um, in uh, offsetting the increase of costs. And we knew going into the project that mass timber was a more expensive solution. So the way that we approached the design and the way that uh, you know, the budget has been set up was a consideration from the beginning. So it wasn't something that we learned as we went through. We knew that this was the case. Um, as we get, um, what we weren't prepared for was the market conditions in Toronto right now is extremely high and hot. There is a number of work right now, and frankly, no one needs more work. And so with that actually comes more increased costs, and also just the level of risk on a subtrade level in that um, you know, in BC, where wood projects have been happening for a while now, and there are a lot more, there's a lot more uh, subtrades that are more comfortable with the material. Uh, here in Ontario, it's predominantly a steel and concrete kind of, you know, province. Uh, not as many people are, um, uh, you know, familiar with uh, mass timber and how to construct it. We are um, hearing that people like the Carpenters Union are training people heavily in order to kind of prepare uh, skilled workers for this kind of uh, coming rise of mass timber. So we think with all of those kind of aspects, you know, the Arbor is meant to start construction in about two years. Perhaps the costs will come down at that point, but we have to kind of work with what we're, the metrics that we're seeing now. That's right. So the speed of construction. Um, so that is one aspect in which we're working very closely as to understand, can we reduce the time on site and um, uh, in order to reduce the cost? That's exactly one of the areas. Exactly. Well, the CLT is um, uh, what they harvest trees that are about 10 years old because CLT is effectively dimensional lumber that's cross laminated. Um, and um, so the CLT panels are typically um, made with trees that are roughly uh, in the 10 year mark, from what we understand. Yeah. Those are actually conversations that we're having currently. I just came from one <laughs> before coming here. So this is exactly the type of conversation we're happening, uh, we're having right now um, in that, um, and, and we're in design development still. Um, so it's happening quite early. Normally we would talk about some of these specific details in construction document phase, but we've been doing this um, early on in the, in the design development phase um, in order to develop these kind of plans that Jesse was talking about, which um, are extremely important.
So um, the design assist, uh, it was a question about the design assist process and how we were going to sequence it and work with the, the process in itself. Um, so um, there were a couple of reasons why um, we um, are uh, feeling design assist is the way to go. Uh, the first is, is that we want to lock down the timber. We want to get the arbor in... Um, in, in the in the scheduling system, the second is is that every uh, what we're realizing is every CLT manufacturer has slightly different dimensions of the lumber and of the panels, so we need to understand that before we complete our construction documents, and also the connections um, are very important, and the um, the uh, CLT and glue lamb manufacturers will be preparing the connections. Uh, that we'll also need to understand early in the um, detailing process. Um, so uh, in terms of locking down the supplier, it's, con it's becoming a matter of schedule as to when we want the, the wood on site, um, and also in terms of the development of the drawings. So we're looking at the schedule in terms of when we're going to be getting into that phase in order to detail, and then when we need it. So within the next couple of months, um, we would like to lock down a... Um, timber uh, supplier as a design assist. So where are you in the design process right now? So we're in design development, which is uh, not your standard design development. We have a number of detailed elements already in place. Uh, all our fire um, solutions and our fire details are pretty well resolved. Uh, we're working through the prefabricated wall system. Uh, we have a, a general strategy for it that we're trying to resolve the details for. Um, so we're in design development technically, um, but we are in advance to uh, detailing. And we were detailing as early as the schematic design stage um, because it was directly informing the uh, design of the project. So the question is about general maintenance of the building. Um, so the wood structure um, will have to, we are going to be um, specking the wood with uh, sealers on it um, when, it's con when it's installed. Um, the wood, when it's exposed to UV, uh, should ha it likely will have to be resealed. So that is a maintenance aspect. The, the client will have to um, uh, understand that they'll have to reseal the wood after a number of years. Um, it doesn't affect the performance of the wood once it's inside the building, um, but it'll, be, uh, it'll cause some kind of visual um, uh, fading of the wood. And we do have um, a handful of wood columns on the exterior of the building, which will have to be sealed on a regular basis in order to um, maintain their, um, their uh, resistance to, to water.